Thank you everyone for coming out tonight for the uh, latest edition of the AO Journal Club, uh, Damage Control Orthopedics versus uh, Early Total uh, Care. Um, my name is John Hagedor and I'm gonna be uh, helping moderate this session tonight. Uh, I have some great uh, AO faculty with us, Thomas Krupko and Mai Nguyen, uh, who uh, helped uh, put all this together and uh, nothing would be possible without them. Uh, a couple housekeeping items to start off. Um, we have uh, no disclosures which are relevant uh, uh, to the, the presentation here. Um, and then Zoom Etiquette, we have uh, turned off your microphones and videos. And uh, please, uh, if you look at your uh, Zoom bar, you'll see that there's a question and answer uh, button that you can hit. And uh, when we get to the end and we get to the open uh, discussion with our Journal Club faculty, uh, please write any questions you may have on there and uh, we will get them to the faculty or respond directly to you. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please let us know. Uh, Chris is here at the AO to help with any technical difficulties. So thank you. So here's our uh, Journal Club faculty. If you reviewed the website, this is truly an international faculty and, and thought leaders in, in this process. And I'm uh, thankful to all of them for coming out and taking the time to do this. Uh, this is uh, your, definitely your thoughts have uh, transformed how we care for patients. And it will be a great, uh, great addition to hear everything you have to say tonight. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have three videos with uh, interviews uh, with the uh, faculty on the papers that were selected. And then at the end, we'll have the question and answer session. And I hope that by the end of this session tonight, uh, that you'll be able to accomplish these learning objectives uh, as listed here. So without any uh, further ado, uh, we're gonna start with uh, uh, Dr. Krupko interviewing Dr. Bone. Uh, and we'll go from there. So uh, thanks for coming and enjoy. And so the the um, first question I guess I would ask you would be for the uh, historical context, basically that 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 led to not only the, the paper that we're we're discussing from 1994, but your previous work from from down in Dallas um, about early uh, nailing of femurs and and how care was done before that versus what you were trying to change initially. Well, um, historically, um, I let let my, let me talk about myself for a moment and not sure. the and not the, the papers. I'm I started as a general surgical resident in the early 70s, 1973 to be exact. And I was uh, a general surgical resident in Buffalo and my mentor was John Border. And during the five years I spent working with John, who was a general surgeon, not a trauma, not a uh, orthopedic surgeon, um, we discovered that when you fix long bones early, patients had a better outcome. And there was some data coming out of Europe to indicate that was the case. And uh, John, in fact, um, believed it and studied it as part of his research in, in how man died after trauma. Um, how we used to alternate frac fracture call with the orthopedic department. So as a general surgeon, we did every other night fractures and we used to fix them, fix femurs early. Uh, we played it most of them in the, in the seventies and that we were uh, students of the AO and uh, the general or the orthopedic department put them in traction. And John could see that our patients, the general surgical patients did better than the patients put in traction. So um, fast forward a few years and I'm now a resident in Dallas and my mentor there is Ken Johnson. Ken asked me to sit on a panel of a general surgical grand rounds to um, discuss fat emboli syndrome, which was the pulmonary problem in it in the, at that time. And during that discussion uh, on the panel, I told them that in Buffalo, we fixed fractures early and we uh, basically eliminated fat emboli syndrome. And they didn't believe us. They, they thought we were crazy. I was crazy. What do you mean fixing a femur fracture will eliminate fat emboli syndrome? Well, it, 
it does. Um, so I talked to Ken following that symposium, that Grand Rounds, and I said, you know, we have to do some uh, research that shows the orthopedic community and most of the rest of the general surgical community that early fixation of fractures will reduce morbidity and mortality. And that's the uh, origin of the prospective randomized study that we did between uh, 84 and 86 and was published in the journal in 89. But that brought us to the 94 paper when while we had shown that uh, early fixation reduces uh, pulmonary complications, we wanted to know, does it reduce mortality? Mm -hmm. And um, not enough of our patients in Buffalo died, luckily, because we were, we were doing early fixation. We had nothing to, to no control. So we, we, uh, I decided along with my fellow at the time, uh, Kevin McNamara to, um, have a multi-centered um, study of uh, with other uh, centers that do early fixations to get enough numbers to, um, uh, to, to have some sort of statistical s significance. We, we picked centers that not only were doing early fixation, but had a trauma database uh, that, so it was prospectively, um, uh, the, the, the data was was placed prospectively and then we went in retrospectively and, and, yeah. and pulled it out. And our control was an American College of Surgeons um, database of the multiply injured patient, but it was a database prior to 1989. So there was, there were almost no early fixation patients in that group yeah. because nobody really was doing early fi fixation. Okay. I, I can't guarantee that, but we made that assumption. Mm -hmm. And then looking at the 676 patients treated early versus 906 late, the mortality rate was significantly reduced with early fixation. I mean, by more than half. Um, how exactly did you evaluate, before any of that happened, how did you evaluate if a patient was appropriate for early total care? Were they adequately resuscitated and did they have adequate oxygenation? Okay. And that's where that's where people miss it. When when there's when there's problems is they get focused on, oh, I've got a femur fracture, I've got to fix it. No, you have to resuscitate the patient first and you have to evaluate them. Are they stable enough to undergo the surgery? And we were in Buffalo, uh, able to, to do that because we were our we were the general surgeons. Mm -hmm. We resuscitated our own patients. We didn't have to rely on somebody else. We made the evaluation, are they stable enough hemodynamically, uh, pulmonary wise, to undergo surgery? And if they weren't, two one of two two things we did. We we resuscitated them until they became stable enough and then did it, or we would do what became known as damage control. Is how did your work in early total care, in your opinion, change change the field? Um, and what were the positives and the negatives of this? And and was were some of the negatives a result of uh, need for more data or misinterpretation of the data? Um, and um, what are your thoughts on all of that? Uh, it changed how fractures were treated in the multiple injured patient. Uh, it was a sea change. I mean, it, when I was a resident in, in the 70s, patients were put in traction, period. That's, you, you, you had a femur fracture, whether it was isolated or multiple trauma, that was your treatment. They thought that seven, day, seven to 10 days of traction was better uh, for the healing of the femur fracture because you got some sort of, um, callus, early callus formation. And then if you nailed it, it would stimulate that callus and they would heal better. And the model be injured patient. If you wait 10 days, you may not ever get to, 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 to fix them. Yeah. So it, it, uh, it really did change the landscape and the downside of it as to follow up on your question was that people, um, as I said earlier, focus so, so much on getting the femur fixed that they, 
they forgot to uh, make sure they were re resuscitated. I think uh, that orthopedic sur trauma surgeons after the 89 paper pushed general surgeons to be aware that fractures are a, a really important part of the multiply injured patient, not just from fixing them, but from their blood loss, their pain, uh, open fractures and infection that can become septic. Uh, we train them to appreciate the musculoskeletal injury. Um, it's the early total care has gone to early appropriate care, which I, I mean, I, I did that. I did the idea that we fixed every fracture on the night they came in. No, we didn't. But so I'm a great proponent of damage control in the situation where if you try to do it otherwise, you, you've, you've made a huge error. And, and so it's, I've been, um, I've been painted as a guy who doesn't believe in damage control. I believe in it when it's appropriate and the patient will tell you when it's appropriate. All right. And our next interview uh, will be uh, with myself and Professor Pape. Uh, and so enjoy. Well, as I said, uh, it was part of the prospective randomized trial where uh, we wanted to get uh, further interoperative uh, information, uh, perioperative information on patients that underwent uh, femoral nailing. And the background is that uh, there was a group, uh, there were multiple groups involved in this, uh, uh, so most of them coming from Germany, uh, and they looked at the effects of uh, fat embolization during reaming. Uh, it was, uh, there was a, a controversy going on. Um, and uh, so then it was uh, interleukin six and eight were new parameters. And so we, went, we figured out that uh, we have to, at the same time, evaluate if these parameters are, are, um, um, are making sense. And um, everybody was uh, speaking about clinical effects only. And uh, we felt that it's like a puzzle. It has multiple small pieces. And that's why we felt that maybe uh, subclinical parameters, just like interleukins, um, would make sense to measure. No, I think among, uh, if you look at the three parameters, IL-1 was uh, probably had the, was the weakest one in terms of uh, predict uh, prediction. And so, uh, well, but it was, I think, uh, IL-6 and IL-8 uh, were useful in our understanding of uh, the surgery being a uh, possible insult to the whole picture. So if you have a patient with a very severe chest injury, uh, badly resuscitated, uh, that is rushed to the operating room uh, too quickly, and you do uh, a surgery too long, with this, this whole combination, you can still see that these patients uh, they, they should, if, if then you, uh, you create a rise of interleukin, uh, which is a subclinical parameter, then maybe it, uh, it does affect the whole outcome. And um, so, yeah, it's just useful to, for our understanding nowadays. Well, the idea at the, that stage was that uh, uh, you have a, an initial infl infl inflammatory peak uh, that uh, 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 normalizes. And uh, if you look at some clinical parameters, uh, you know, you, you, you make rounds on the ICU and uh, day one, two, maybe uh, day three, uh, oftentimes the patients have a positive fluid balance um, and they have a drop uh, in coagulation parameters such as platelets. And so we try to use all these easy parameters. And um, <clears throat> uh, I believe uh, another factor that uh, played a role was the degree of chest injury, uh, which in the 80s and 90s was tremendous. You know, uh, many people came with uh, severe lung contusions. Um, all these situations have uh, improved quite a bit. And uh, I believe that the ventilators have become better. And so, 
Um, what used to be uh, a very high peak initially, followed by uh, the state of dysergy. I think it's still existing, uh, but the, uh, we don't lay, uh, we don't see so much late organ failure anymore. I think we we tried, we even tried to prove it. Uh, in 2018, it was published in Journal of Trauma. We tried to to prove that uh, the, the amount of ARDS uh, is, has improved, but we couldn't uh, find it uh, enough evidence in the literature. Uh, but uh, certainly, uh, if you if you look at uh, some of the um, ICU papers, you can see that uh, some of the, the dysRG, um, uh, it's not as bad as it used to be anymore. That's mm -hmm. why we also, yeah, I think it had, has influenced our surgical strategy uh, in multiple ways. We have found uh, in another publication that um, IL-6 IL uh, is slightly more sensitive, uh, sensitive in general, whereas IL-8 uh, would be better for patients with a severe chest injury. Um, and uh, at some stage, I used uh, daily measurements. Uh, now we rely on other factors as well. Uh, I think uh, coagulation is very important. I think uh, Dr. Valier has shown that lactate plays a role. And after her, there was another few publications by a uh, group, uh, Desman, uh, from, I think they're from Baltimore. And they looked at serial lactate values, which uh, make a lot of sense. And so if a patient is not able to clear the lactate, if the patient uh, doesn't improve his coagulopathy that is, exists early on, uh, then we know we have a problem. And I think uh, another very important uh, factor that is uh, underestimated many times uh, is uh, the degree of soft tissue injury uh, of the extremities in general, or, and or uh, if you have a vascular lesion and you have a reperfusion injury. That to my mind is, uh, is tremendously underestimated. Okay. So I think we moved away a little bit from Looking at isolated parameters, we uh, we look at uh, multiple parameters. We try to cover, you know, coagulation, um, acid base changes, uh, the degree of soft tissue injuries, and you can do. Uh, there are four different, uh, four or five different scores uh, in the literature. Uh, there's a polytrauma grading sc uh, scale, there's early appropriate uh, care, um, and um, we personally, I personally, uh, oh yes, I have lactate in my, uh, it, is, it is there, but it's not the only parameter. I look at uh, pulmonary function, I look at coagulopathy, um, and um, I also um, want to see if the patient uh, is uh, physiologically not stable. So, um, yeah, my take home message for residents would be, if you look at one parameter only, the IL-6, uh, it is only a piece of the puzzle. Well, thanks for inviting me, and it's always a pleasure to speak about this topic. Um, I, I thank the AO for giving us the opportunity. Uh, and our final interview of Dr. Wynn with Dr. Valier. Dr. Valier, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and the pendulum seems to swing back and forth between damage control and early total care. Uh, your paper had laid down some important concrete parameters for early appropriate care among polytraumatized patients. Can you please share with us the current protocol that you have at your institution and any changes that's been made since the publication of the paper? Sure. Thank you, Mai. I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of this journal club, club session. Um, so, you know, my concern with this all along is as I got into practice, I realized that this is a spectrum, like many things that we do. It's not an all or nothing thing. And that early total care concept, when we recognize the value of expeditious uh, fixation of femoral fractures and major axial injuries that are going to relegate a person to a recumbent position, um, we also recognize that that can be. Uh, excessive surgery, particularly in patients that are not adequately resuscitated, hence the need for damage control strategies in certain patients. You know, it was kind of um, 
troubled as I got into practice that there really weren't very clear um, indicators as to when to approach one strategy or another. A lot of it is based on, on anecdotal experience and institutional memory and experiences. Uh, so there were pockets of activity where there was more damage control going on and other places where there was a lot more early care going on. And then also issues around what does that mean early? Does that mean within 24 hours? And it's very arbitrary just because we, we said it's 24 hours because there's not a lot of of prospective literature or higher quality literature that's really looked at this. And so that that was a lot of the impetus for our team to start to look at this more closely at our trauma center. As a result of that work, which entailed collecting an awful lot of, of uh, laboratory data over the first uh, four days of, of, of course after an injury, as well as specifics on injuries to other body systems, the type and timing of fixation strategies that were employed and uh, underlying uh, medical issues, if there were any, um, we came up with the early appropriate care parameters. And our our goal as a team, which is a, when I say our team, was a multidisciplinary team. We had two anesthesiologists, uh, two uh, general trauma critical care specialists, one neurosurgeon who also did spine, as well as our director of spine trauma, who's actually orthopedic trained. Um, myself, um, a biostatistician who also has a PhD in applied math, and two research coordinators who are all working together um, to try to sort through this. And what we what we found is is we wanted to have something that would be simple that could be easily applied to a broad spectrum of patients very quickly, would be easy to remember, and that it it would. Um, not need to be modified a lot for outliers, say with a severe head injury or advanced age or all of these things so that we could keep it pretty basic, um, yet it would improve upon the work that we were already doing as an institution. Ultimately, we were hoping that we could come up with something that we could share and that could be applicable to other trauma systems, but we were able to come up with a simple uh, group of laboratory parameters that um, have to be trending in the direction toward normal, which is reflective of metabolic acidosis that remains, which as we know, is an indicator of major hemorrhage related to trauma and can be confounded by other things like alcohol or, or toxins or um, uh, glucose. Uh, but for the most part, our, our pretty simple way to determine someone's oxygen carrying capacity and their ability to tolerate major surgery one of the things that fell out in our model was um, coagulopathy. It, it didn't appear to have as much impact. And I think it's because as that acidosis is being corrected, um, even with just a very broad resuscitation strategy and not something specific like using Rotem or, or, or TEG or a lot of the newer strategies that came about, um, we, those uh, measures of coagulopathy will also correct while the patient is responding to the resuscitation in the great majority of cases. And so in our system, as we get down to what are called the EAC parameters, that was targeted to provide us with a reduction in the number of early complications that we were seeing in our polytraumatized patients with these fractures of interest. And so in our case, we were trying to take it uh, from about a 20% complication rate in terms of um, pulmonary complications, which are pneumonias, pulmonary embolism, um, as well as uh, DVTs, um, infections, and things that we would see in that early period, the pulmonary complications being the majority, of course, of those, and to drop it in half, basically, to go from a 20% a to a 10%. And our mathematical modeling specialists determined that by following these parameters and paying a little bit closer attention to the resuscitation, we could get into a safe realm where we would easily meet that based on our historical precedent, which was on a sample of about 1,500 adult multiple injured patients with at least one of these fractures. And so it, it, in, in looking at those um, incrementally, the values are really a lactate of less than a four or a pH of greater than or equal to 7.25 or a base excess of less than or equal to negative 5.5. Many of you guys that have done trauma for a long time look at that and, and go, wow, that's really, that's pretty extreme. You know, that's the patient's still fairly acidotic and they are, 
but they're correcting. And um, it took a lot of scrutiny from our group and a lot of debate when we looked at the data that we had from our own experience to say, wow, we have the courage to try this because it seemed like maybe it would be too aggressive, yet it worked. And it did drop our complication rate. Our complication rate was already pretty good and certainly comparable with other major US trauma centers. And I think you know what we found in looking at the experience that had been published from other centers on a, on a worldwide basis for that matter, there's numbers that are thrown around, but they really don't have a lot of supporting research evidence. And it's difficult to do because it's hard to create um, prospective parameters because you have to have a buy-in of the entire team of people to do this and you have to have system approaches. So that was one of our strengths that we had a team that wanted to try this. And even though we said, wow, we're, we're gonna do this, and we're gonna try this, it's a little bit more aggressive. We went to all of the department meetings from the different so trauma some specialists and we agreed as a group that we were going to do it um and we did and and those fractures can be fixed at our place every day of the week including the spine fractures which again many hospitals don't have that capacity or even to do pelvis or acetabulum every day and I, I think in the ideal setting all major trauma centers worldwide would be able to handle that and we're not there yet but that i see that as a goal for us in, in the future and so you know when we look at um, what we were able to do, it dropped the complication rate down quite a bit. It also, because of that, reduced length of stay in the ICU, reduced the length of stay in the hospital, led to a substantial decrease in cost for the hospital. And so I turn around and use that for our administration to say, we need more OR support. We need access to the OR every day. Maybe we need more than one room because these cases need to get done. These patients can't wait. All right. So uh, thank you again for some great interviews. I um, know this is a broad topic and uh, uh, if you all have questions, please uh, go to the question and answer button and type them in and we'll be monitoring to uh, answer those questions and we have more people coming in, that's great. Uh, but to start off with the, 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 the panel of our faculty here, uh, a lot, I was gonna ask a question so everyone could have time to write their own, but. There, there's a lot of focus on the, the, the chest injury and uh, how that involves it, but there's also talk about the head injury. And we didn't talk a, a lot about the head injury and in the interviews and things of that nature. So when, it, when you're deciding how to treat these multiple injured patients, uh, how does the head injury play into your decision-making uh, with that? And that, that's to any, any of the panel, Dr. Pape or Dr. Valier or Dr. Bo. Well, I can start with that one, John. Um, you know, that's a really important consideration. And I think it, in general, I would hope that most major trauma centers have a, a, a track record of communication across disciplines. And so there's um, key people from each team who are present as these patients arrive and as they're undergoing evaluation, resuscitation. The very severe head injuries, fortunately, are not super common, um, but, they, but they, they occur often enough. And when someone has a, a severe head injury and there's, um, you know, the brain is at risk, we measure the um, intracranial pressure, of course, and many of those patients have continuous intracranial pressure monitors placed. You want to try to keep it below uh, 20 is usually our goal at our institution, but it, when it's around 20, it's often difficult to get them to the OR because it's going to fluctuate. When you transfer them, when you start working, it's going to want to go up. And that also reflects, of course, the cerebral perfusion pressure, which is really the number you want. And you can back calculate it based on what the um, patient's blood pressure is. Suffice to say that it's, it's more important to make sure that the brain is being adequately perfused than it is. It takes priority over any of our orthopedic injuries, um, un unless there's someone exsanguinating, of course, from a, a pelvis or extremity, and then you're kind of doing everything at the same time. Um, I would say that uh, once in a while, we, we simply have to wait. And when someone does have that severe head injury, that's one of our indications to use a damage control strategy when we can. Some fractures, of course, are not amenable to that. There's not a way to place provisional external fixation or to provide some type of, of uh, preliminary and provisional skeletal stability, but we do our best to do that and try to do that early on, either the first several hours or within that first day following their presentation. 
Um, and then we can continue to reassess and work as a team when it's safe for them to go back. Now, sometimes uh, it happens that maybe they have a femoral fracture in a pelvic ring, but this severe head injury, you end up waiting to do the orthopedic work definitively because of the head injury and they, are, they have a chest injury that starts to worsen. Sometimes you need to wait five to seven days for their chest to start to improve. So it gets complicated in the multiple injured people, but probably the most important principle of all is really that you're continuing to reassess and you're continuing to communicate at the attending level amongst the different uh, service teams. So we all recognize our own part of the, of the package of um, delivering the best care possible to this injured person. Thank you, Dr. Valier. Um, any other thoughts on uh, that from any of the panelists? Uh, hi, John. Um, I, I totally agree with Heather and it gets back to her uh, discussion about having a team approach and the team approach has already been discussed is there's a protocol for how to manage a multiply injured patient with a severe head injury. It isn't discussed at two o'clock in the morning with people screaming at each other, trying to take care of their individual bit. Um, it, and I totally agree. Uh, head injuries will dictate what you can and cannot do and damage control is, is often the answer. Okay, thank you. Um, I see that there's a think, question uh, on <clears throat> I think that um, yes, Professor Bobby. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm on, but um, I think that uh, a lot of the times, uh, if there's a really severe head injury, it will block us from do anything else from the orthopedic uh, point of view. But uh, it is our it is our uh, the purpose of, uh, of us being on, on, on rounds, on call every day, is that whenever we can chime in, we should do it. And we should try to fix the orthopedic uh, problem whenever the neurosurgical problem is solved. So there's a question uh, in the, the, from an attendant. Uh, great to have you present uh, to answer our question. Dr. Valier, for the early appropriate care pathway, do patients only have one of the parameters in the desired range, i.e. lactate less than four, pH greater than 7.25, or base excess less than 5.5, or do all three have to be present? So that's a really important question, and, and it's one that we did some additional work on, and actually uh, Doug Weinberg was the first author on a paper that addressed that question. Uh, and another question about um, sort of incremental um, issues around the labs and the timing thereof. And so the, the bottom line is that uh, only one of the parameters need be corrected in order to keep the complication rate low. Now they're going to move as a group, right? And so they're all kind of moving in the same direction, but many places won't be checking all of them or checking all of them at the same time. Lactate, of course, is the easiest to check because you can get it from a venous sample and it tends to come back um, very, very quickly uh, from, from the lab. And so um, all you need is one. If you have them all, it just means the patient's just slightly further ahead on the whole resuscitation path. All right, thank I you. I have for a question. Oh, sorry. No, 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 sorry, sorry, Mike. So um, thank you so much for uh, all the panelists to be here today. I, uh, I'm just honored to be in the presence of you all. And uh, I have a, a comment and a question from that. Um, and going through your papers here, I think it's pretty apparent to all of us that it takes a village to take care of polytraumatized patients. And your papers are from the top leaders in the field here really, I think, put orthopedic surgeons in a different light. I think we are generally depicted as the bone doctor. You know, we're all familiar with a cartoon when the, uh, the patient is in asystole, but the orthopedic surgeon have to fix the bone. But I think the paper that you presented today really showed that we are much more than a bone doctor. We really take care of traumatized patients. And in this case, we really put on the captain hat, you know, telling the rest of the trauma team and involve the rest of the service of when is the right time and advocate for our patients so that they can take, get taken care of appropriately. So it seems to me like you were able to create this cultural change, not only in orthopedic in your own department, but across other department in your institution as well. 
And I'm just wondering if you can share with us advice for young practitioner like myself of you know how to go about that change. And I'm also wondering for questions for the rest of the attendings out there too, to see if at your institution, the changes that we talk about today, the parameters, are they being followed? Is a protocol like that in your institutions? And how can we get every, everyone involved and be on board um, with, with this culture change that we've been talking about today? My, that's a super important point. And I think every system is different. And so it's tough when you first start out because you probably don't know anybody unless it's a place where you trained. And then that's tricky too, because they're going to view you as, oh, you're the resident who came back or whatever the case may be. And so it's, it's a challenge to establish yourself, establish a line of thinking around patient care to communicate that. And I think that you know, we all have strengths and weaknesses, but being present communicating, asking questions, looking for common ground, reviewing papers together, and just really generating those academic discussions out the gate. If you recognize a point of, of uh, debate and differences of opinion, then, then um, sit down and explore that and look at some cases and figure out what does the literature say or should we do our own study on this? And I think just engaging your colleagues in constructive conversations is really the, the first step. And it all comes back to really wanting to do better by our patients. And I think if you emphasize that it takes our individual passions and um, sometimes frustrations out of it, we have to work constructively or we won't make any progress. We actually could, could move in the wrong direction of harming relationships, which could, which could make patient care more difficult. Um, I think for us at our, uh, I feel really blessed to have been with colleagues, a handful of whom were very like-minded and I recognize that. And so it was a wonderful opportunity for us to work together. However, there were a lot of naysayers within the system. We had to work on them individually and in larger groups and kind of share information and ask questions and be respectful of their experiences and their opinions, because that's really how we get buy-in and that's how we continue to get better. And I think that um, what was fun is that during our time working on EAC, it led to a lot of other related projects, which were very um, helpful in, in all of us uh, moving the, the needle on and in, in improving the care that we're providing, not just in the setting of, of multiple uh, system trauma. So uh, if, I'm, if I'm allowed to say something, um, I feel that uh, in, in, in the US American system, it is really important to have a combination of orthopedics and uh, general surgery working together very closely. So you have to have a, a, a tight connection between uh, orthopedics and general surgeons. I think uh, Dr. Bone has done it very uh, well in Buffalo uh, many years ago, and they have, uh, they, have, they have set the path. And this is what you need to do. Uh, because there's one group that knows how to fix the fake fractures and there's uh, another group that knows how to care uh, about physiology and uh, these groups need to come to together. Uh, I had the privilege to work in, uh, in Pittsburgh for quite a while. I was uh, very, very close to Andy Peitzman and we actually, I went to his operating room and I told him, okay, this is the kind of patient I have here. What, I, what can I do? What do you think? And this and that. There was a very close cooperation. And this is, I think, what it needs uh, because we all want to fix the fractures early. And uh, the goal is not to fix every, every uh, fracture early because um, this is kind of a misunderstanding that uh, came out uh, at some stage but we want to have a safe, uh, you can say early appropriate care, you can, save the, uh, you can say safe definitive surgery. I think they are very much the same, but um, at the end of the day, you want the patient to, have, to get out of the hospital with the least uh, amount of complications. Um, I think ARDS and multiple organ failure are not the real problems anymore. Uh, fat embolism syndrome 
has been has been cured. Um, it is it is a, is a problem, but it is a really small problem. It used to be the the biggest problem ever uh, in the 70s and 80s, and Dr. Bone took care of it. I would say, and uh, so nowadays we're just talking about tiny little uh, adjustments of this uh, problem of how much can we do, how much surgery can we do within the first uh, 24 hours, uh, 48 hours or 72 hours. So that's my understanding. Did you all sign off or something? No, no, we're here. We're just making sure no one else has a response. So we're still here. There, um, is there a question in the chat that you see out there, Tom? Uh, there, there are two, two more questions. Yeah, yeah. both uh, Dr. Valier uh, typed uh, an answer to, uh, but I think both are good. Be good to, to bring up and, and uh, talk about. Unfortunately, I can't zoom up now. Okay, so the first one was from uh, David Burns. Uh, said, does the second hit phenomenon only apply to femur fractures? Can we do early total care on tibias or upper extremity fractures while the patient is resuscitated in the OR? Um, so yeah, if I, I don't know if you just want to go around the panel again. I think Dr. Dr. Bone maybe wanted to say something about the last one too. So I, I don't know if I cut him off, but. Oh, there I go. Uh, I did, I did want to say something quickly about the last question. And that is, it's a lot easier to be a, a orthopedic trauma surgeon today and having a team put together than it was 20 and 30 years ago. The data is out there. If you are having trouble with your team, get the literature and show them what, how, what has been uh, processed and what we've learned over the past 30 years. And as, as Professor Pape says, it's now really uh, uh, very small increments that we're talking about. Oh, the data is there. Get the get the literature out. Get your team together. Write the protocols and take care of your patients. To answer the the last question, um, this is where I I think early total care got a bad name because what we used to do, if we had a, a femur fracture and a tibia fracture, uh, we might two team that patient and 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 treat and treat the, or a forearm fracture and a femur fracture. We would, we would do them simultaneously, um, always conscious of the amount of blood loss. It, it just reduces the injury volume by stabilizing the fracture, which also stabilizes the soft tissue, which Professor Pepe talked about. So yes, it is possible to do more than one injury uh, during the initial uh, stage of stabilization, as long as the patient is monitored correctly and continues to be uh, hemodynamically stable. Well, I personally think that uh, that's also, uh, there's a difference between uh, the US system and the European system. And whenever the European system learned about early total care, they thought that, uh, you know, you take care of every fracture, every abdominal, every thoracic injury. Then at the end of the day, you fix uh, uh, mid carpal fracture, uh, which may take another uh, hour or so. That was co completely wrong. And uh, that was 20 years ago. Um, nowadays, I believe that, uh, we have several uh, parameters uh, that can uh, uh, we, we, we can uh, we can uh, monitor the patients much much better uh, by using multiple systems and I think Dr. Valier has uh, has taught us that uh, the endpoint of resusc resuscitation uh, through uh, lactate levels are extremely important and uh, that's really important. And in addition to that, you can have uh, severe vascular injuries, you can have severe soft tissue injuries that uh, will have secondary complications to these patients. Um, and so basically I think we are still learning. 
we are still learning. I agree. We, we are still learning. I agree with all that, what has been said uh, by, by doctors uh, Bowen and Pape. And just building on that, um, some of the data that we've published shows that you can safely do this. And it's something that we all know from our practice, but every patient is unique and maybe it's not the right time to continue with that care. You need to look at the whole package. Don't get too focused just on the acidosis. You've already established that it's correcting. If it's correcting, then that's fine. But maybe there's injuries where there's profound soft tissue swelling and it's not pertinent or appropriate to proceed with definitive care of those injuries. Maybe there are some uh, open fractures that need debridement and it's a simple procedure that can be done concurrently um, without a lot of additional soft tissue damage in OR time. And so you elect to definitively, you know, plate a forearm or an ankle. Each case is gonna be unique. But I, I would caution you, especially as you get started in practice, things usually take longer than you think they will. And it's very important when you're getting started that you communicate effectively with the people on your team, the anesthesia um, attendings, the general trauma critical care specialists here, and ask you, know, how much time do you need? And if you keep giving them really inaccurate estimates and not communicating effectively about what you want to do, or you suddenly do two more things and you said, there's not a lot of trust going to be there. And it's very important to have a solid relationship with trust and with, with open communication. And that's how you're going to be able to have a team that's, that stays together, learns together and is effective longer term. And you're also going to just take better care of your patients. So if, the, if you're, if you're ever in doubt and you think, you know, maybe this these soft tissues can't handle it, or maybe it's getting too late in the day, or this person's not oxygenating it as well, then it's time to stop. And, and you want to have off ramps where you can stop and do the right thing for that patient and for your team. I think it's a very uh, important aspect. Uh, and what you would have, a, what you what you're saying is communication between uh, general surgery and orthopedic surgery. It's, it's, a, it's a fine balance. And then anesthesia comes along. And so all these three people, um, whoever is the most senior, probably will tell you, oh, I want to go this way. But yeah, I mean, you, you, you are the only one that says, OK, uh, I need another 45 minutes for debridement. And my initial debridement is so important. If I don't do this, uh, there's going to be a, a secondary septic insult. And then uh, this patient is not going to do it, do it so well, uh, despite all the other factors going on. And they can ventilate uh, the hell out of the patient, but uh, you know there's going to be a, this septic uh, insult. Uh, so orthopedic surgeons are extremely important, and we we should be aware of that. Okay, I wanted to follow up on that question, and, and that is when. Uh, that the OR is not a bad place to have a patient with an anesthesiologist at the head of the table ventilating the patient and the uh, uh, general surgeon watching over the uh, parameters as you're doing the, the surgery. As long as you're not bleeding the patient, uh, doing things like uh, debridement of an open wound to put an X fix on it is take the time to do that. Because if you don't, the, the outcome of that open fracture may be bad and the patient isn't gonna do any better in the, in the intensive care unit that they can't do in surgery. It's about continuing the proper resuscitation during surgery. Bailing out often isn't the answer. And, and I think that rings true, Dr. Bone, because probably everyone on this call has been told by someone that you can put an X fix on in the ICU. So why are we going to the OR? You know, in some version that's been brought up, but uh, that the OR is almost the best resuscitation vessel we have in some respects. So no, excellent. But, you excellent know, but I think it's really important because what Dr. Bone has taught everybody is that uh, you need to go to the operating room. And uh, you know, if you are, you have to, to you have to find the, the true cause of dem uh, of of of, uh, of uh, hemorrhage. And uh, 
if you if you decide, okay, I'm gonna uh, give it away to the vascular guys, they it may take two hours, but the, the surgeon is the one that can solve the problem really quickly. And uh, early acute severe hemorrhage should be should be covered by the surgeon. It should be covered by the surgeon. It's really important. I had a question real quick for the, the panel. Um, it was really interesting to see uh, kind of the evolution of the, the whole process. Oh my God, my, my motion activated light went out. That's really bad. <laughs> Bad timing, bad timing. But it's it's really interesting to see the evolution of, of the science here and, and how much you guys were able to change the, the field in a relatively short period of time. My question is, for me, it's easy to look at this and, and get the impression of, we got this, we figured this out. Um, and But I'm sure there was somebody back in the 1970s putting somebody in traction and saying the exact same thing, right? And, and so for from a group of people that have really driven the, the change, where do you see this going? What's the next What's the next step? How can we continue to improve? I know Dr. Valier kind of hinted at this a little bit already, but but where where do we go from here? I think we're really fortunate to work in a time when we have a lot of information and we have a lot of really interesting questions to answer. And, and I think in the coming years, we'll be able to further improve the care we're giving on more of an individualized basis based on genetic profile and based on markers, including markers of coagulation and inflammation that we will have more rapid access to. And I'm really fascinated by, by all of it. Um, and I think that also our ability to collect data, to store data and share it very quickly with our colleagues at other centers will further improve the communication and the amount of data that we can amass over a short period of time so we can continue to reflect on that and make these um, incremental improvements. I also think that there's more experience now, particularly amongst trauma surgeons, really globally, in doing work together prospectively. We have data systems in place that allow us to collect things in a safe way, uh, to store it in a de-identified way that's compatible with institutional regulations, and the, that we're um, in good shape to start to address some of these things and really um, I think, I think personalize and tailor our, our resuscitation and our care plans even more as we go forward. Yeah, I would totally agree. I, I, I think that uh, our struggle is uh, or has been to get to the operating room and uh, try to take care of the fractures. I think there has been a time where uh, too much was done and that was corrected. And I think uh, since the year 2000, um, we are pretty much, uh, well, almost uh, sorted out the problem. And um, yeah, you have to imagine that uh, ICU has improved, um, ventilation has improved, uh, resuscitation has improved. And we are looking now at uh, a very, um, very, very, very high st standard of care. And at this standard of care, we are able to fix many, many, many fractures uh, definitively. Maybe not within the, the first six hours, but then within the first 24 hours, you know, fix them, fix a few, put them to the ICU, fix another one, and then uh, just continue. And this is the way the patient will tolerate everything. And uh, if the, the, the head injury is not too severe, I think we as orthopedic surgeons, we, we, are, we can be extremely um, productive and, 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 and we can be, uh, um, we can be so, uh, we, we have success, which never used to be the case. We used to be, you know, the, the, the carekeepers of somebody else. And now we can be uh, the people that, uh, you know, we are, we are making sure that the patient will walk out of this hospital. 
if the if the head injury is not too severe, we are the ones that um, that make it happen for the patient. So I think we should, we can be proud of it. Excellent, uh, excellent uh, discussion. We are hitting the eight o'clock hour. So is there any other uh, comments or thoughts from our uh, uh, panel, Dr. Bone, Dr. Pape, Dr. Valier? In closing, just one comment from my. Um military experience, I am certainly glad somebody finally figured out that when you are injured, you bleed and that you ought to replace with it with blood. It, it, took, it took us so long. I am so embarrassed to tell you how much crystalloid I used to fill my patients up with. And uh, one to one to one, it was a huge difference. And if you, if you are uh, have the ability to do um, a, a fresh blood drive ever. I can tell you first from firsthand experience, there's some wounded warriors out there that are walking around because uh, we, we were able to give them whole blood right out of the tap. All right. No, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be on this panel and I'm very, very honored. Uh, and I think we are, we all have contributed to uh, the patient care and the outcome. So thank you very much. I too am very honored to, to be part of this, this group and this discussion, which is a, a work in progress. It's really uh, been a lot of fun to learn and to continue to, to contribute and I look forward to more. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you, Dr. Bone, Dr. Pape, and Dr. Valir for coming out, and Dr. Wynn and Dr. Krupko. This couldn't have happened without, uh, without you all, too. So thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for everyone who showed up tonight to participate. Uh, be safe. Have a great holidays. And uh, there will be a little survey for the CME at the end. And uh, as I said, be safe out there. So thank you, everyone.